Welcome to Wild Turkey Science, a podcast made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow. I'm Dr. Marcus Lashley, Professor of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Florida. And I'm Dr. Will Goolsby, Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at Auburn University. We're both lifelong hunters and devoted scientists who are passionate about hunting, managing, and researching wild turkeys. In this podcast, we'll explore turkey research, speak to the experts in the field, and address the difficult questions related to wild turkey ecology and management. Our goal is to serve as your connection to to wild wild turkey turkey science. science. Here today with Dr. Craig Harper, who is probably uh, one of the most requested repeat guests that we've had on Wild Turkey Science over the past few months. Uh, welcome back, Craig. Good to be with you. I'm not sure why that recommendation would come through, but whatever I can do to try to help y'all good fellas out, I'm glad to do. Well, well we sure I mean, appreciate it. I think it's just a combination of the the humor, you know, combined with the knowledge and potentially even the good looks. <laughs> well, I will say uh, none right, of those I've enjoyed comments. I've been with y'all, but I'm going to let it shut her down on this end, boys. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to save that one. Uh, none of those comments have actually come through YouTube, Will. Uh, I will say that. So I just wanted <laughs> Wait, to make his, turn, make his face turn red if I could. But uh, yeah. so, so you just got back from a, a pretty unique hunt. I I have had several unique hunts lately. Yes, uh, I've, I've had a good season. My wild turkey season has been somewhat protracted. With fortunately, I had the, the great fortune of going to uh, to Mexico to hunt oscillated down in the Yucatan near Belize, and then uh, I went to Australia with. Uh, Kip Adams and Bronson Strickland, and we went down there and visited with the Australian Deer Association and spent a couple of weeks doing a lot of work down there and had a great time. But that, you know, as you might imagine, cut into my early wild turkey season where I might have some some work trips down to South Carolina and, and Mississippi that that didn't get worked in this year. But no, we've it, it, it's been good. Very good. Yeah. The, the oscillated trip was was really neat, obviously. I've been to Mexico before, but not to that area of Mexico. And that was a unique experience. We were hunting in the jungle. And so we saw all kinds of wildlife, you know, of course, curacaos, but also things like howler monkeys and spider monkeys. And uh, the the people were super, super nice. It was a very good experience. The turkey hunting was very, very different. They, uh, at, at least where we were, they were using electronic collars where they... Mm-hmm all for the male and try to mimic the male and at least as i was told the male then comes in out of curiosity to check out another and i could say that probably happened but it's possible also that the ones i killed just happened to be you know coming through the area anyway but but that was very neat to kill obviously a different species of turkey uh not the wild turkey but the oscillated turkey, the the colors were gorgeous. The the landscape was unique and very interesting. And and I also can say they eat just like a wild oh, turkey. I, mm. I, I didn't have a wild turkey side by side to taste test, but we ate oscillated in the jungle, cooked over a uh, fire, and it was absolutely excellent. Very, very good. Do you think it's something you, you'd want to go back and do again? I probably would, but, you know, and, and I thoroughly enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. But if I were to choose another trip to Mexico to turkey hunt, it would be another Goulds hunt. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the color of the Goulds, that's my favorite. And the country that you're in you know i was down there a year ago and we were in the sierra madres in uh northern mexico and chihuahua and uh it, it, it's just gorgeous i, I absolutely love that country mm-hmm. and and again the, the people are, are are so good uh so nice and and glad that you're there and that's that's always fun to be around and the hunting was good and uh i, I would i would definitely 
like to go back to try and, and hunt goulds again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Both of those are on my bucket list to do eventually. Yeah. Yeah. It really sounds like the oscillated. It's all about kind of the environment and the atmosphere. You know, maybe mm-hmm. the, the birds don't work at all like what we're used to. And you, there's not really as much of that back and forth, that interaction that we all crave, but it sounds, right. sounds super interesting nonetheless. Right. Just to be I, in, a, I, in a jungle like environment like that. Yeah. I, right. It's, 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 it's totally different. And if you go just, you know, be ready to experience something different and soak it in and, and enjoy it. And, and I don't know if y'all want to get into it or not, but I also understand y'all had an interesting hunting experience. (laughs) We did just recently. Yeah. You you, you want to get into that one today, Marcus, or save that for another? Well, we could give people a little teaser of it and then maybe go in detail when we have a little more time to ourselves. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I came up to to Alabama. Will had uh, set up a, a nice hunt with one of his buddies. And uh, I just came up to be along for the for the hunt. Will, you want to tell everybody what happened? Yeah, I'll just I'll just give the uh, the brief recap, and like you said, Marcus, we can come back in another episode when it's just us and <laughs> give the full detail. Because I'll spare Craig; I've already given him most of it uh, already. But you know, we ended up staying with a bird uh, pretty pretty much shortly after fly down. You know, he may have even still been in the tree when we we first heard him, um, and ended up staying with him for about what was it about three hours, um, like that. and and tried almost every trick in the book, you know, at least the ones that we can think of. And, uh, finally, you know, it it almost got to that point where we had resigned ourselves to losing that battle. And we even discussed going to another bird that was gobbling on several occasions. It was a little bit farther off, but, uh, we stuck with him and, uh, I made a couple, I guess, motions you could say for wrong decisions, which luck, luckily (laughs) Marcus and, and the, the guy we were hunting with Michael overrode me on. So it ended up being a, two to one vote uh, on, on two decisions that we made and they made the right decision both times. And we ended up finally killing that bird about 10 o'clock. So yeah. it, it was one of those. Turkey. That, oh, it was a beautiful Turkey, beautiful backdrop, you know, to honey man. And it was just one of those when you grab him, you know, it was just so sweet because we had fought him so hard for so long. Uh, <laughs> and it was just, it, you know, like I said, I'd resign myself to thinking this, there's no way this is even going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so when it did, it was just incredible. Yeah. Well, of course I saw the picture and I know the picture will be on your website somewhere, but my question when I saw the picture is, Hmm, I wonder how long it took them to set that up and <laughs> get the angles just right. And, Make sure his beard was showing and all that. Well, we had hair and makeup there, so they get they do a pretty quick job. <laughs> yeah, it did take us a minute to get that staged, but uh, we made it happen. It's a, it's a good picture. It looks good. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. I learned from the best, Craig. <laughs> that but was yeah, for we, you, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was some sweet little soft sweet. Cu- calling and sweet talking that sealed the deal on him yeah and we sat on that knob if we hadn't mm-hmm. sat there on that yeah. little knob yeah and it was happened. down to and it was down to the last you know few minutes of the hunt we didn't know because how we were set up we didn't know whether marcus was going to kill him or i was going to kill him it was, just oh, it was all the way i was literally on looking through my scope waiting on his head to pop out when you shot mm-hmm. thinking yeah. I, it's imminent one more step and he's dead and then you and just as <laughs> and just as luck would have it, there was a little canopy gap. You know, Craig, you were talking before we started recording about you've been asking God for some help lately with some <laughs> things. I, I, I asked God for this help, and he he <laughs> aff- afforded me a canopy gap that was growing a little bit of grass in the understory. It was like a little patch of spike uniola that Marcus had to look through, and it obscured the bird's head just long enough for me to yeah. shoot it. <laughs> when I, and then see, and that goes against me because I've been on a mission to kill the grass. I've been killing all the grass I can kill <laughs> in that one patch. I didn't, I didn't get it and it obstructed that shot. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was quite the special hunt for Marcus and I to uh, share together as our first hunt. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. I hope we do it a lot more together over the years. Good day. I'm glad to hear it. 
So the reason, you know, we really wanted to have you on today is, is you shared some statistics from your ongoing work in Tennessee that um, I think really resonated with people because of um, they, they paint a picture of brooding and nesting cover being severely limited across the landscape, but highly selected for, and they also, the conditions that we're being selected for conferred a significant increase in nest success. So I was kind of thinking that we could start with rehashing that, if you don't mind sharing that information, and then we can go into more about, you know, how common is that across the landscape and these common situations that hunters and land managers encounter, and more specifically, the things that they can do to implement uh, better brooding and nesting cover across their properties. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, what you're getting at is I shared with you the the countywide data from those counties that we were working in or, or still are. And in particular, early succession and shrubland only represented about 7% of the counties, but about well, nearly, I think it was mid 40 some percent of the nest, 45, 46% of the nest were in early succession and, and shrubland. And that was, you know, very enlightening to see that type of selection. And of course, turkeys don't have to have that to nest successfully. And, and uh, you know, all kinds of studies have, have been clear on that and, and shown that to be true. But it's pretty interesting to me that the hens, when they have some of these vegetation types available to them, they are seeking them out. Mm -hmm. And at least intuitively, you have to think that, you know, perhaps this turkey knows better than I do about where she should nest. Although uh, success generally was a little higher in the, the early succession. I think in early succession, on average, our nest success has been 36%, and that's with, with hundreds of nests. And uh, and down as low as the single digits or even zero if the nest occurred in uh, hay fields, in row crops, places like that where, where the cover was, you know, exceptionally poor. But in woods, it's typically much more variable. But on average, our nest success in the woods is is pretty good. I think it's in in the high twenties, maybe up to uh, to thirty or or something like that. In in some woods, not not in all woods. But you think about how variable the understory structure is in woods, and and also how relatively easy that is to manage or manipulate. And I say easy, and and somebody who is on a lease block, of course, they would say, well, it's not easy for me at all because I can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so if you can't manipulate the canopy of the forest, then that's true. And if you can't burn, that's another limitation, et cetera. But all things being equal, if you are able to manage your woods, then you certainly can influence the structure that is available to either nesting or brooding. And so from that, uh, we look at the structure that is typical uh, at, at nest sites and, and at brood sites and then try to uh, mimic what we see being selected and what we see that might be more uh, successful on both public lands management, where I may work with, with WMA managers, for example, and of course also on private land sites. Well. Craig, I, I was just curious, um, and I I know that I've looked for it in the literature, and it's a little bit sparse. So I'm asking, I guess, more for for you to draw from your experience when you go when you're working with with landowners or, or um, uh, managers on on public lands or whatever. When you're seeing a landscape that you consider to be really high quality, where it's providing adequate nesting and brooding cover. Can you describe to us kind of what does that look like? I'm assuming that it's probably more than 7% of the landscape, but do you mind walking us through what a property might, you know, if somebody owns a hundred acres or a couple hundred acres, what would they be trying to accomplish in general? This is going to sound 
a little different from what I just said. Like, you know, this this doesn't mesh with what he just said. But uh, I, I go back to that term Fred Guthrie used, which is slack. And so there's a broad range mm -hmm. of, of uh, structure, hover that turkeys can nest in or brood in and do well. And when I think what you're probably trying to get to is I, I, sh I should have 72% uh, closed canopy hardwoods. I should have 18% shrub, you know, and I, I can't do that mm -hmm. um, because let's say, for example, you've managed your woods and, and you're in an area Maybe there's some topography and you've used the topography to manage the south slopes different from the north slopes. You've done a lot of canopy disturbance. You can use fire. You can take that wooded environment and have some areas that are closed canopy uh, forest, but other areas where you might only have 30% sunlight coming in that canopy and you're burning it every one to two years. And you could have other areas where there may, for example, be 50% sunlight or 75% sunlight coming in and you're burning it more infrequently. And, and you can certainly see birds using those areas for nesting or brooding, just like they would use early successional areas. And, mm -hmm. and I'll try to define at least how I believe those terms should be defined through the ecological literature. Early succession are those plants that are largely herbaceous and shade intolerant, need near to, if not full sunlight, and think of old field environments. And so I'm not talking about regenerating woody stems that are coming up after a harvest. That, that's not early successional vegetation. That's simply tree sprouts. And But so you can get the same value for brooding or nesting in forested conditions as you can in mm -hmm. early succession. Now, all things being equal because of the, uh, the the food availability, and that may be through invertebrates, that may be through soft mass, um, various things. I think it's very important to have a variety of successional stages and a variety of vegetation types on a property that is managed specifically for turkeys. Turkeys are what we commonly recall, uh, commonly call a, a generalist species. And so they don't have to have uh, large tracts of forest. I mean, you can find them from South Central Kansas all the way to uh, the, the North Woods of North Central Pennsylvania and, and places in, in between. But where they have a good mixture of things, I think most people would agree that more typically than not, you can have good robust populations because you have a variety of opportunities for nesting and brood rearing, summer foods and winter foods, roosting and loafing areas, and that provides you with more opportunities for management also. And so to kind of take the bait, if you will, I'll, I'll go ahead. And so I, I, I would not want less than, and this is just my personal opinion. I, I don't have, you know, hard data to say you need this percentage of this vegetation type and this percentage of that. But I certainly would want a, a, a minimum of, of 10% of uh, a property in, in early succession. And, and that might go upwards of uh, 30 to, to 40%. Um, there's lots of things that you can do and get out of early succession. You can manage them differently for more dense vegetation that might be attractive for, for nesting and, and not that large of blocks. And with increased disturbance more, more frequently, uh, generally have better conditions for broods. But it, it's it, there's so many what ifs. Mm -hmm. I mean, the site on, on dry sites that don't need to be disturbed as frequently versus wet sites down in the bottoms, where if they're not disturbed literally, every year, at least every other year, they're going to have trees that are 15 to 20 feet tall, mm -hmm. sprouts that will grow that much in one year. And so your disturbance regime obviously has to match the site and, and the, the landscape that you're in, because and, you know, obviously the, the soils, uh, moisture regime, et cetera, because there's, there's so much variation. <clears throat> so... so 
Go ahead, Will. I was just going to say, so you, you talked a lot there, Craig, about disturbance regime. Would you say that it's a, uh, a fair statement to say that the problem with most properties that you encounter through a um, through a turkey management perspective is that they have little to no disturbance regime currently in place at the outset? Um, that That's common, but most people who have property and they're trying to manage for turkeys or or deer for example and those are the two obviously uh main species that landowners are managing for they're, they're implementing some kind of disturbance a, a lot of them are mm -hmm. but the type of disturbance they're implementing maybe you know and we've covered this before maybe they're going out there and mowing their fields in in may and june you know the disturbance that they're using might not be the best type and it might not be uh, the best timing, it might not be the best frequency for what to help increase productivity on their property and, and fill in the gaps uh, for for the limitation. Um, a, a common one, fields are good, right? That's what everybody thinks. Mm -hmm. Fields are good. Turkeys, turkeys need need fields. Turkeys are seen in fields commonly, but turkeys are seen commonly in woods also. But just because you have a field does not mean it's good brooding cover. If that field is is dense and rank at ground level, uh, it, it's it's not going to be used as much, especially in the interior, uh, as it would be if that structure were better for broods. And so there are various management strategies, obviously burning being one and disking being one, that you can help reduce uh, the the clutter and density of of vegetation, especially thatch, uh, at, at ground level, um, using whether it's according to the the circumstance, broadcast or spot spray herbicide applications to get rid of uh, whether it's native or non native warm season or cool season grasses. I've, I've said before many times, and I stand by it. Um, Unless you're a grassland obligate songbird in the eastern United States, you don't need more than 30% grass in fields to be more productive for the vast majority of these species that we're managing for. And, and that includes bobwhite. And uh, for, for turkeys, I don't want a field chock full of grass. I want certainly more forbs. Um, think, about, think about broods and, and even adults, you know, uh, male groups that are loafing. Um, you're not going to see them loafing in the middle of a field in the middle of summer when it's 92, 96 degrees outside. They're going to be searching for some shade and hanging out in, mm -hmm. in the shade. And so having fields that have, you know, it might be the the scattered oak tree or hickory tree it might be a clump of, of sumac or wild plum it might be you know whatever that that is coming up out there having some tr scattered trees and shrubs is very good and and you can maintain that even if you're using fire if you're using relatively low intensity fire and you just let the fire move right through this we, we do it all of the time commonly on many properties every year just because you have some trees out there doesn't mean the fire is going to kill them and a lot of times you're having to use fire with a higher intensity to keep the the tree cover knocked back and of course there's other ways of doing that and uh, uh selective herbicides is one and mechanical methods as well but meshing that structure with the life cycle is is i think critical and and I think it also comes out in our data that the, that the birds are selecting for that um you know I think you asked at one time about nesting cover and and the density and and what it looks like at at uh you know at you know about a two foot height well the density is oftentimes such that you can't see farther than than maybe you know uh 10 to 20 yards, maybe not that much. And when you have that type of density, you, you think about what that looks like right now. You're in, you know, essentially uh, some, some woody stems, shrubs, regenerating trees, relatively tall grass, maybe some brambles, et cetera, an overgrown field. And you're trying to walk through that. Well, 
that you're, you know, having to scoot through the stems and, you know, you might have a briar picking at you here and there. Well, I don't think hens like that e either, but that's where we see them selecting lots of times when that type of cover is available to them for their nest. But almost always, and, and lots of studies have, have shown this, that the nests are closer to an edge, a road, a trail than you would expect at random. And when you look at the average distances, that is almost always between maybe 20 to 40 yards, something like that. And so to me, as a manager, then I think, oh, so I don't need a hundred acre field for nesting. In fact, I'd rather cut that down such that it might not be more than 30 or 40 yards from the edge to the center. So, I mean, that you, you use that information to, to give you some direction for what scale you should be managing for with regard to nesting cover in, in this example, and then also uh, for brooding cover. And uh, that that helps you, I think, decide how large of an area to, to manage for, let's say, with prescribed fire, or even if you're using a, a bush hog in, in late winter, how much do you need to mow or how much, how large of an area should you disc? You know, that's that's helping you with your scale of management on the property. <clears throat> Craig, before we turned on the, the recorder, you were talking about a field that it was a rel relatively large field that you had broken up similar to what you were just describing and trying to connect it to a, a, so a nesting field, I guess, to a brooding field. Is that right? Could you tell us about well, that? That's an illustration from one of the WMAs that we've worked on. And, 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 and we help lots of managers and, and mm -hmm. the, uh, the WMA managers in, in Tennessee do a great job. They work very hard. They have a lot more land than they could possibly get to. And, you know, you got to pick and choose your battles to go at. And so we were looking at this one field. It, it was a large field, probably. Um, don't hold me to this. I think it was around 30 acres, somewhere in that neighborhood. And, you know, okay, what do we do with this? It's got all kinds of stuff growing up in it all kinds of species, even calorie pair and, and stuff like that, that that you don't want anyway. And uh, looking at it, I thought, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of what most people would call an overgrown mess, but uh, I guarantee you <laughs> there there are turkey nests out here mm. or, or, we, or will be when, when turkey nesting season comes. And I said, uh, you know, your disturbance regime on this side to maintain turkey nesting cover, what, what I'm calling that at least, is, is every few years. You wouldn't necessarily disturb that every year because, you know, this, this structure is good. And so what if you just broke this up into three different sections and you burn one of them each year on a rotation? You have a relatively wide fire break in between the three sections and all the way around the field. And then, and th there was a complex of fields in this area of, of the WMA. Then on this WMA, on this, on this field over here that is adjacent, like with a wide hedgerow and it might've been, you know, a, a drainage in between or whatever to, to another field, manage this field more uh, for, for broods. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like in, in, uh, late January, February, whatever, go in and disc at least half of this field. Next year, disc the other half of it. And so your structure then at ground level is going to be very good for broods. Your structure in those fire breaks are going to be perfect for a hen to come out of. And, and, those, and the sections that we set up as the nesting blocks, if you will, they weren't any more than about 80 yards apart. Is, you know, I think mm -hmm. a, a good arrangement. And so there the manager had in, in the center this relatively large field that he now is, is managing for nesting cover. And adjacent over here on this side is a field for brooding. Over here was a different situation. There was a lot of perennial plants, a lot of which were not desirable. There was uh, Cerisia lespedeza in there and, and uh, 
some some other things. And so I gave him some herbicide recommendations and and some pre-emergence herbicide recommendations to as well as a post-emergence herbicide recommendation to take care of some of the undesirable plants, you know, that uh, if they're leafed out when he treated them. And to include those pre-emergence herbicide applications that would take care of some of those problem plants and thus by default maintain more of an open structure at ground level. And so uh, he had already sprayed the grass uh, years ago. It had been planted uh, to native warm season grass, you know, the big blue stem, little blue stem, switchgrass, Indian grass, you know, so, so thick, nothing but an elephant or a cotton rat is going to be found in there. And so, <laughs> okay, here's how you get rid of this mess. And, you know, to have a few clumps of those is, is great and fine, but you don't want something that is just so dense with grass. If you're looking for food plants and if you're looking for a uh, better brood cover, uh, et cetera. And so he had taken care of that. It's all looking good. And then adjacent to all of that was a uh, a section of woods. And uh, we went in and we thinned out uh, a section of woods to allow about 30% sunlight to come in and use prescribed fire in the woods. And uh, Shazam, you know, the, the broods are found in those areas. Turkeys are found nesting in those areas. And, and it really changed how that, you know, the attractiveness of that area to turkeys for, for different uh, portions of their life, not just mm-hmm. for, for one. And of course, we left the, you know, nearly all of the desirable oaks uh, for, for fall foods. Um, there's brambles around for, for soft mast. Uh, so anyway, that's one example of, of setting up <laughs> what you might call a field complex such that you're managing different sections in different ways for different reasons. So did you see a sharp decline in the elephants? <laughs> I'm kidding. They, you don't they, even they, need to respond. Try and get me to say things is going to get me in trouble. And I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't even respond. I'll just stop you there. Oh, man. Yeah, well, I think, it. you know, we get a lot of feedback to, just as you do with people, you know, trying to envision what this looks like, what are they trying to accomplish? And, you know, you're, when I asked you about the composition, you know, of a property, that's because people ask that all the time. And I think uh, one take home of that is if you're managing woods that might decrease your, your uh, dependence on fields, not that you don't need any, but you know, that's right. Depending on what what uh, land, what your landscape context looks like, and what you're doing in different places, it can change the arrangement of these different kinds of things. But also, you know, like you just described there, where you're trying to create different, you're deliberately trying to create different vegetation composition and structure to achieve. Uh, you know, different habitat components for the species all in relative close proximity. I, I think that's really valuable for people to kind of think through that and then try to apply it to your own landscape. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think that's a great um, visualization. Something else with the woods that I think is is very important is consideration of your woods roads. Uh, most people who have woods have some kind of trail mm-hmm. or, or road system through them. And so Managing those such that you have a preponderance of forbs along your road instead of roads that are just, you know, again, thick with grass. And uh, I looked at this in the the mountains of North Carolina and those roads that were dominated by orchard grass, hardly used by the broods. Those roads that were dominated by uh, clovers or by naturally occurring forbs coming out of the seed bank was one of the most sought after features that that hens with broods would use. And so having enough sunlight coming into your woods roads, you know, daylighting your woods roads to provide at least enough sunlight to to have good vegetation along the roads is important, but uh, not necessarily 
so much sunlight to open everything up totally that that you have an mm-hmm. explosion of growth in the roads that makes it so thick that it might be uh, undesirable structure for for the brood. But uh, again, mm-hmm. don't don't overlook that 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 is a a, a strong feature for for broods and and also managing those low areas that will oftentimes have uh, more forbs than than the drier areas. That's very good. Still allow a little sunlight into those by killing some undesirable trees and allowing a little more sunlight to, to filter in. That can really help the, the cover there. And then in, you know, more of the upland woods, as I, as I mentioned, I really like, you know, somewhere in that neighborhood of, of 20 to 40 percent sunlight really creates a, a nice structure. And, and in general, we're talking about vegetation that is high enough that conceals the broods, but yet the the hen can can see over that. She likes to have good visibility. I think we can all uh, agree on that. And not so much clutter underneath that's impeding the the broods from from moving around. And and you know, number one, you got to get them from an egg to the young broods and young broods to older broods. And once they get to be older broods, you know, they can handle more, you know, rough structure out in fields that are more dense and rank and whatnot. But uh, for for those for the uh, those young poults, they they they're not navigating through some of that jungle that uh, that that's present in these fields. And and I just asked Joe Quayle; he's one of the graduate students on the Turkey Project, and we haven't finished all of this analysis, but. Uh, in a majority of these fields that are early succession in the counties where we're working, most of them are rank fields, <clears throat> with the exception now of, of, of a few that we help the landowners in. But um, in those openings, that's where the broods are using around the edges. And as I've mentioned before, that causes a lot of people to think that, oh, turkeys like to hang around edges. Well, I don't think they like to hang around edges. They just don't like to hang out in the middle of something that they can't hardly walk through or where they're so exposed that they know the predation risk is increased. You know, for example, if you've got mm-hmm. to go into closed canopy woods and some of some of these some of these stands, you literally can see two to three hundred yards through the woods with 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 hardly there's hardly any understory plants. And so obviously if a hen with a brood is using that in in that type of environment, she's uh, terribly exposed. And then when she goes to the edge of the field and here's all this, you know, vegetation is so (laughs) rank at ground level, they can't even navigate through. Well, where where do you think they're going to be? They're, you know, just kind of moving along the edge. And and that's exactly what we're seeing, Mm -hmm. you know, especially with the younger brood. So even when you're tracking hens with the transmitter that have broods or transmitted broods uh, you have some of those as well that you're basically seeing them what you're saying is relegated to that edge between the rank fields and the woods with poor structure in in my opinion relegated is a perfect word okay good job marcus I'm going to count and, that and one <laughs> I, I would say the same thing for a bob white and I would say the same thing for a cottontail rabbit yeah. If, if, if you think about it, yeah. if you're a rabbit or a bird hunter, and the first thing you do is put the dogs out around the edge of the field, why, why did you do that? Why did you do that? Oh, well, that's where that's where the birds or the rabbits are found. Well, why? Why aren't they found out here in the middle of the field? Mm-hmm. See, if you manage the field correctly for birds or rabbits, then rabbits would be out there. Mm-hmm. They don't have to be. There. Right. So, it's just a byproduct of the fact that the vegetation at the edge of those fields is usually shorter and less dense because they're competing with those trees that overhang the field for sunlight. Mm. Yes. uh, The, in the middle of the field and in old fields, you know, these, and especially, and let's, let's take a second here, especially these fields that previously were hay fields or pasture. Mm -hmm. And so they're dominated with grass. Mm-hmm. Now, if you take a crop field, those animals are going to be next to the, the edge of the woods or, 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 you know, whatever that's along the edge because there's a lack of cover in the crop field. 
Mm-hmm. And so that, you know, we have to, okay, it's a crop field. It's it's a working field. Uh, this this field is not being managed for, for rabbits or birds. So, of course, they're going to be relegated to the edge. That's, mm-hmm. that's totally understandable. But what I'm saying is if you have property and you're managing specifically for turkeys or for for Bob White or rabbits or whatever, deer included, and then you're seeing a propensity of use around the edges, you just identified a limitation. Mm -hmm. A limitation that's the the interior of either of those vegetation types is not meeting the needs of those animals. Mm -hmm. So let's differentiate, you know, working lands that are, you know, agricultural lands for crop producers versus uh, properties that are being managed for wildlife. I, I, that's, a, that's a huge distinction. Mm-hmm. not trying to, you know, say farmers are managing their fields incorrectly. Uh, there are some things farmers can do. And, of course, they many of them uh, implement practices such as field borders and, and that type of thing, which are hugely important. Mm-hmm. But a uh, big difference between the, the fields on ag lands versus properties that are specifically managed for wildlife. Mm-hmm. Wild Turkey Science is part of the Natural Resources University podcast network and is made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow, a grassroots organization dedicated to the wild turkey. To learn more about TFT, check out turkeysfortomorrow.org. Thank <laughs> you.